Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Rick Muir. I'm the uh, director of the Police Foundation, um, and we're delighted to be uh, hosting this uh, webinar, uh, co-hosting this webinar this morning with Resilience First. Um, I'll just say a bit about the Police Foundation. We're um, the UK's independent policing think tank. We're a charity that carries out uh, research into trying to support the police service to, to improve um, its effectiveness. Um, and we were delighted to be doing this event this morning on a very timely theme of uh, uh, community resilience and policing. Um, uh, I think, you know, it's clear that given the current crisis that resilience is going to be one of the big themes of the next decade um, uh, in terms of, you know, how communities can be resilient to all sorts of th threats, uh, whether that's crime, whether that's other forms of harm, whether that's emergencies, um, civil contingency um, uh, crises of the kind that we're dealing with um, at the moment. Uh, and what I hope we'll be able to discuss today is, um, you know, what what communities um, need in order to be resilient uh, against these type of challenges and what the role of the police is in particular, working in partnership with others um, to try to uh, build community resilience. And we're delighted that Sir Craig Mackey, um, the former Deputy uh, Commissioner at the Metropolitan Police, has agreed to share his thoughts with us uh, this morning uh, on this theme. And so I'm now going to hand over to uh, Bob Rothenberg uh, on behalf of Resilience First to, um, to, to start the event. Thank you very much indeed, Rick. Um, well, can I welcome you all to this Resilience First webinar as well. Um, for those of you who have seen the video of what we do, I hope it's given you at least a brief insight into the organisation. Um, Resilience First was created nearly two years ago to help build resilience in, in business communities, whether that be communities defined either by geography or indeed by industry groups, sector or special interest. Since its inception, we've attracted over a dozen major companies as what we call champions, as well as a host of affiliated organisations and members to our network. And they've all been willing to help us spread through uh, their, their, their businesses, best practice and learning. The current commissioner of the Metropolitan Police Force, uh, Cressida Dick, has said that, the, that communities defeat terrorism. This statement can be expanded to include other lawless areas, uh, behaviour from tackling street crime to social disorder. Of course, it's also true for defeating our latest threat, threat COVID-19. However, bringing communities together as a multiplier is not an easy task. It involves businesses, both large and small, residences, schools, sports centres, churches, and any others operating in a common space for public <coughs> benefit. So this morning, and by way of an informal conversation, our guests and I will try to explore how policing and law enforcement can help to build greater resilience among our communities and businesses, including policing the pandemic. And um, I, as Rick, are delighted to welcome Sir Craig Mackey here uh, this morning. Sir Craig's biography has been circulated, so I'm not going to repeat any of this, other than to say I think he's going to help us this morning uh, through what are some interesting uh, and challenging times. Um, Sir Greg has agreed to say a few words to start us off, and then I will try to uh, eke out of him some elements which perhaps will be of interest to everyone, um, and also perhaps then invite Sir Craig to answer some of your questions. So could I ask you to post any questions you have online, um, and then I'll try to pick out those where there's a common scene. So without further ado, Sir Craig, perhaps I can say the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Good good morning, everyone. And thank you, Bob. And, and, and thank you, Rick, for this opportunity. Uh, perhaps to, to, to begin, uh, when, when we planned this event, we were looking at quite a different world. We'd have been all together. Um, we'd have been in a room. Uh, we'd have been sharing uh, ideas and talk and thinking. Uh, things have changed quite dramatically in the last few months. Uh, you can, and, and I'm very conscious that people 
uh, taking part today, um, even if they're sheltering at home, um, all the way through to those who are first responders, they're doing something really, really important to help the UK at this time. So first off, it's a really, really big thank you for everyone who's on today uh, for what they're doing to help in this space. And you're right to pose this as something about resilience. I should add, when I talk about resilience, yes, I'll refer at times to some of, uh, uh, of what academia has said over the last 10 or 15 years about how we build resilience, but I'm talking about it very much as a practitioner. It's very much my experience of, of uh, my working life in both particularly Cumbria and London and looking at what does it take to build resilient communities uh, right across the board. And, and I've always been very strong on you build resilience on a day to day basis. I see it very much like a bank account. You put credits in by good interactions, good policing, good contact, good networks. And then in times of crisis, you start drawing from that bank. And we're clearly in one of those times at the moment where we are drawing from that bank. And I'll touch on the end why I think there's some positives in this. But we can absolutely learn something about resilience and what works because the questions posed to us are come on then how do we do it and what works we know from looking back over some of the things that have affected crisis events and impacts not on the scale of of, of the pandemic but we know some of those things that, are, uh, that that have an impact and i would highlight three that we focus on information and communication systems and processes and people and why are those crucial we talk about you cannot do anything without good information the reality of anybody managing a crisis or trying to deal with something is they'll almost certainly get the information they need on day six to have made a decision they should have made on day three the reality is the information never keeps up and never works at the pace you need it to work to make the decision but you need to share information quickly with people who are involved to build their confidence and their resilience so things when we talk about in good times things like information sharing agreements between business and policing between communities and policing they're not just nice to have they're absolutely essential and that leads to into the issue of communication the reality is when crises take effect and when you need resilience in an organization, a lot of people's horizons close down, uh, their fields effectively, uh, they look at things in a much smaller field, much smaller lens. Um, and that's very true of what we're seeing at the moment in terms of, uh, uh, of what's going on in the, U in the UK. People have closed down to a much smaller area, what's happening around me, what's affecting me, what's affecting my family. So how do we communicate in a way people hear and understand? Because when we're trying to build resilience, it's no use us saying, well, we put out a press release or we put something on Twitter and everyone must have picked it up. The reality is we need to use a, a whole range of plethora of means of communicating and we need to be very straightforward in how we communicate. Because what will happen in every times of crisis and stress as well, you will get what we're seeing during this pandemic, you will get um, uh, false rumors and stories that emerge uh, out, of, out of left field. And you as an organization, be it a business, it affects you, be it a public authority, need to be able to respond to those. I give you a real example. Um, I still am amazed some 10, 12 years after the event, dealing with the flooding in Cumbria in 2009, being asked in an interview, was the flooding caused to protect a red squirrel population in the Cumbrian Lake District? Now, it's a conspiracy theory, but it just gives you a feel for, if you've never been in that position, the first time it happens to you, it's quite a, where did that one come from? You know, we're here, here loss of people, damage to our communities, and someone's asking me about red squirrels or the Manchester water supply. Um, the reality is that those conspiracy theories take hold. That's why you need good communication. And then those systems and thinking, uh, those systems and processes. The reality is if you don't plan for these sorts of things in your day-to-day -day business, if you don't plan for disruption, if you don't plan for 
uh, uh, supply chain shocks, loss of power, loss of your business premises. The reality is when this happens, it can be catastrophic for your business, your employees and the community you work with. You have to plan. Now, that doesn't mean you have to plan to the nth detail and take all innovation out of the system. There's some learning from, from around the world that says actually organisations that allow their staff a bit of space to think differently actually do quite well. There's some interesting research on the back of um, Hurricane Katrina, where a lot of the federal agencies got a lot of criticism. One that didn't was the US Coast Guard. There's a review of the US Coast Guard that talks about their their uh, approach of what they call control slack. Because they're not that well funded, they train people on a lot of the principles and then allow them to make decisions in a framework that works in that time and space. And it actually allows them to be quite innovative and creative. And that's a really good lesson in terms of, uh, of, of where you go when you're doing uh, uh, these big critical incidents and critical systems. So what else do we need to do as part of those uh, systems? We have to make sure when we're involved in scenarios like we are now, we're capturing learning. Um, it's absolutely crucial as you build resilience that you learn from experience and learn going forward. But it's really, really important and you have to be incredibly careful that what you don't do is capture hindsight. Um, there is a really, really big difference between learning and hindsight. And there is some, there's some work uh, got on across the world about looking at things like hindsight bias and decision making and those sorts of things. Actually capturing real learning that helps the people who come next, helps the organisation understand those things are really important. Something I wish I'd been better at and had done more often is when you're in the middle of one of these crises, at the end of each day, just a simple thing like an action learning log and capturing those notes that you think on day two, it felt like this, on day 12, it felt like that. It's a real discipline that works well, but making sure that you build those systems that work are absolutely crucial. And the third point is that one around the people. Uh, the reality is it's only when you need resilience that you see the strength or otherwise of, of, of your people in the organisation. And the test I put to everyone on the webinar this morning, how well do you know your people? Not I know them because it's, you know, it, it's Joe or Mary in the in the canteen. I say, no, what are their other skills? What are their other attributes they can bring to where you are now and what they can do? And I'll give some real examples of that. I was always amazed working in a, a, an environment like both Cumbria and London of the extra skills people have that they can bring into the workplace that are part of what make them the person they are. And by that, I mean someone working perhaps in a in a role in an organisation that you almost people sadly almost take for granted. But you suddenly find they're the leader of the mountain rescue team. They also happen to know how to do fast flowing water recovery. They're a first aider that's got a better qualification than your first aider in your own organization. These sorts of people exist. How do you harness them and how do you know who they are? And when you're talking about people as well, it's also about making sure that you're training your people to, to understand some of the challenges they might face. And some of that training is getting people used to dealing with the ambiguity they'll inevitably face as they try to tackle some of these issues around resilience. Because ambiguity is a huge, huge uh, issue in this space that if the first time someone sees it is when something is happening for real, then don't be surprised sometimes if they don't perform as you want them to do, or if they uh, if they stutter or fail on it. And the other thing to do as well as we talk about people, and this is particularly acute as we start to talk about going through the organisation, sorry, going through the incidents and resilience, remember the effect this is having on the people in your organisation of what you're going through at the moment. Um, they are working at a pace and for a period of time that is quite extraordinary. They may well be seeing things that people should never have to see. Um, how are you as a leader going to deal with that? Not just day tomorrow, the next day, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. 
But I'll probably just close my uh, opening remarks about this whole issue around resilience with what I think is a, is, a, is a bit of hope. And I can only bring this from personal experience. I have been humbled on many occasions uh, when I've seen incidents, been involved in things, to realise the level of background resilience there is both in communities, in organisations and individuals. Um, that gives me real, real hope for the future. If you'd have said eight to ten weeks ago, you've got to design a system where people are are crowdsourcing masks, are building stuff on 3D printers for the NHS, are coming together to help their neighbours who they've never met. Most of us say, oh, that won't happen. Society doesn't do that. The reality is society does. And I think um, sometimes we underplay how resilient society can be and how resilient we can all be collectively if we're given some of the tools to do that. So I think it's a note of hope for the future. Thank you. So, Craig, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting there. And perhaps I can just pick up on something, particularly with regard, I suppose, to the people um, and, and the difficulties that you know we've all faced with the pandemic, um, and particularly looking at the, the police force, the difficulties they faced in trying to enforce what are both new you know, rules and indeed uh, the, the, the idea to try to persuade all in the community to go along with those 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 uh, new rules. So that must have encountered great difficulty because in what the way that uh, the police are dealing with local communities. I don't know whether you have got any thoughts on that. Yes, I mean, I mean, obviously, I, I'm not working now. I, I'm in that uh, I'm in that position where I've, I've I've retired and moved on to other things. The reality is, and I think you've seen it in this, you know, police is very where, when you've worked in policing, we're very conscious of we police by consent. We police with the support of the community. And that's really at the heart of, of this whole notion of resilience. You know, we don't have a model in this country and, and none of us ever want to have a model where policing is just a pure enforcement mechanism. Um, and I think policing has, has tried to be incredibly careful in terms of how it manages these boundaries with things. And the reality is, and I'm sure you see it where, where you are in, in, in isolation and lockdown. You know, the reality is 99, 98, 99% of people comply, want to do things, want to make these things work. And, and that's the reality I've seen in, in, in other crises, in other events, when you say to communities, with rationale, you communicate things in a clear way that people understand and know what they can do. People want to engage and be part of it. Will you get people who always want to break the rules and do things? Of course you do. That's that's the nature of uh, that's the nature of life. And I hope we deal with those people uh, in an according way. But I think policing is incredibly conscious, and particularly in the British policing model of the relationship and the importance of that relationship and consent that it has with communities to allow it to operate. And I know talking to, to colleagues who are still working, that's something they think about on a daily basis in terms of not just what the rules say, but how, what's the tone of this, how's the principle and how do they make it work? And if one just takes out a bit further and say, well, that, that's obviously going to take more time, uh, what about the resourcing in context of other areas, you know, be it counterterrorism, be it cybercrime or whatever, and how in the current environment, again, those are particularly dealt with and, and intention is, you know, keeping us resilient as possible? Well, I, I, so I think, you know, um, and we've seen some of this from some of the comments uh, my colleague Martin Hewitt and others have made as, as the Chair of National Police Chiefs Council, you know, policing has seen demand changed as, as every service uh, uh, across the country. I think the public figures were about 20% reduction in reported crime. But, you know, we've seen messages around uh, the prevalence of online activity and online fraud um, and, and alerting people to those. We've seen the challenge of domestic abuse in, in, in lockdown all the way through to child sexual exploitation online. So policing, I think, has been quite proactive in terms of trying to get those uh, those messages out about how it changes and what it does. But it's not uncommon in policing to have to, 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 to flex the service offer sort of in, 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 in sort of management speak. But the reality is to, to say, actually, we've got to triage the offer we make 
around particular services in a different way based on a different threat and risk. This will be quite a long time we'll be doing it, but it's certainly been done in my policing career, be it during civil disturbance, flooding, um, uh, you know, other major incidents where you've had to say the core service for this reason looks different. And I think, again, this goes to the heart of providing we're honest with the public and we communicate in a way that works, then those messages, I hope, uh, uh, get across. But it goes back to that fundamental point for me. It is about building on a day-to-day -day basis through good community policing, those levels of resilience, those levels of understanding. If the first time you talk to a community is when something goes wrong, that's going to be quite a difficult debate. Somebody once said to me, you know, um, it, it's really hard if the first time you've got to manage a critical incident um, is when you walk into the room and it's the first time you meet the other key players around it. A real life example, uh, and the individual did brilliantly well. Um, the chief executive of Cumbria County Council was appointed the afternoon of the 2009 floods. She was having her interview at three o'clock. By later that night, she was in the gold set up with the rest of us delivering a service. You know, that's how quickly things can happen. Um, she did an absolutely superb job, but those are, you know, that could happen to any one of us. Fine. And and how, you know, if you want to look at that, do you actually, you talked about your, the desire to have a log at the end of each day, writing down, you know, what, you know, what you've learned today. Um, and I think that's something that we all should be trying to do, but how do you then disseminate that across an organization, you know, to help individual communities? in terms of what's there so that we can all learn from that from each other well you have to invest time in actually structured debriefing and learning and that's something i learned after a number of 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 the incident there's been a tendency certainly in my early policing service to go through something and go well we did well on that pat 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 off we go what's next sort of thing um I probably learned 10 or 15 years ago that the, the value of, no, actually, what did we really learn on that? What were the bits, if I was saying to my successor, um, what are the bits I'd want you to understand and know to be able to avoid making some of the same pitfalls I had? So you need to spend time, you know, you need to spend as much time in learning and debriefing as you do in thinking about, go cool, on, then what's next and where do we go next? And, and, you know, if one then takes that back to looking at individuals and you know their learning experience through times like this, how much do they are they able to keep a general awareness of what's going on as well as the concentration on actually the day job? Um, because I, well, it's, it's I, I think. That, that, sorry, I didn't mean to cut across you. I think I think they try and do both. Um, so I, you know, absolutely at the moment, the, 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 the day job is there. It, it's exactly the same for, for many organizations. Will, will things be put? It's, it's hard when you're working at an intensity, uh, and a pace of demand to say for someone who comes in the room and says, actually, I want to tell you about something completely different, but it's going to be your problem in two to three weeks time. You know, hopefully good organizations can flex some of this around it just something i've certainly tried in the past with with uh senior teams or boards that you work with is try and keep some of the people not involved in the particular issue or crisis at the time i've done some work post retirement where we talk to people about cyber attacks and those sorts of things and it's really interesting talking to boards where everybody gets consumed in the particular problem um i would say if you can take two of you Put them off to the side even if you want to use them as a bit of a red team to challenge your thinking however it may be but just so you've got some people who are thinking about something other than the challenge the rest of you are trying to wrestle with at the moment it's it's if you've got the luxury of being able to do that then please please do it okay thank you um what a sort of combination of activities between the police and businesses and communities is there to improve community safety and what can we be doing about that more widely um, in, in terms of trying to improve again the relationships within a community so i i think there are a number of things you can do it, it 
probably when you when you hit the point of a, a crisis or, a, or an incident, it's not the time to be trying to create new structures or new systems. You need to be doing these in the good times, in the in 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 the time when you're banking stuff. So it is about using things like uh, business improvement districts. Uh, business crime reduction partnerships. It's about using some of the existing models that are there consistently in a way to improve that understanding and communication so that when something does happen, you've got those systems and processes in place. And through the work, you know, latterly in my service, I was the, uh, uh, the, bis the national business crime lead for policing some of the innovation that's going on between businesses and policing around how it tackles um, some of the threats around business crime are really, really quite interesting. And they're about building long term understanding. One that I was I, I was particularly enthused with um, not long before I finished in policing, we, we started to move to a scenario where we were putting uh, police officers on placements in back into business. Um, so we had officers, uh, particularly with the retail industry, working in key parts of the retail industry, working with key uh, uh, UK businesses, understanding their needs and bringing that back into the sector. The initiatives like that are hugely rewarding and the impact that had on how law enforcement sector gained a better understanding, particularly at that time, of the threat retail and retail were facing in terms of those things are, are really, really important. And initiatives like that help no end. With communities, you see some amazing uh, uh, examples across the country of work going on with communities uh, from stuff going on in both social media all the way through to work going on in the in the physical world you know and the reality is what you can't do is say I'll take this model that you know and my sort of profile probably shows it the two extremes I couldn't take a model that worked with a community in South London and say that will work with a super rural isolated community in the Lake District uh, the reality is you have to have people who sufficiently understand the area in which they were to be able to adapt those practices and policies to work in those areas. And there are some tremendous examples of that working successfully. And if you try again to take that to looking at the community resilience, right, how do you actually then put that into tools that a community can employ? Well, I think there's a number of ways you do it. So you, you, building community resilience is a, is a long term issue. You, you touched on in the introduction, probably 20 years ago, if you'd have if you'd have tried to look for issues like community resilience, there wasn't a lot of academic work on it. There wasn't a lot of research out there about it. People started to understand, be it in um, earthquakes, in volcanoes, all the way through to flooding and other things, that there was something different in the way some communities coped with disruptions, I'll, I'll put as broad as that, threats, risks, disruptions, um, and something different in the way some businesses do. I mean, there, there are some classic examples of businesses who get a disruption to service, sail through it, and are a better business at the end of it. Sadly, there are also some examples where a disruption to a supply chain or a loss of a premises finishes a business. Um, so this this new area of how do we make people more resilient came into place. What it starts to do is, is, is offer you some ideas around how you start to build that resilience. If you look at communities, some of the some of the best works been done around building the health resilience of communities. So you look at some of the work that's been done in major cities around trying to improve the outcomes for heart attacks, uh, be it in Paris, be it in London, where you defibrillators are available, you put first aid courses on, you give people IT that allows them to see if there's a heart attack in my street, the nearest defibrillator is here and the box is unlocked or here's the code for it. Or actually working in this premises is a first aider who can do this. So you start to build those sorts of levels of community resilience that, that helps in those space. So there are some quite straightforward measures you can put in. There's then the ones you can do by actually designing them into the built environment. So we talk about, you know, uh, uh, post flooding and post some of those events. A lot of the work 
around the built environment is about building resilience into those communities, A, to prevent some of this stuff happening again, but if it does happen again, to mitigate and minimize impacts. So it's a, it's a course of things and it really focuses around what you can do around the people, what you can do around the place, and what you can do around sort of the built environment. Okay. Um, and if one then gets into looking at local communities and neighborhood policing, um, you know, how you know, is that going to continue to develop and build a resilience? So the involvement of the police, the continued involvement through what they're doing in neighborhoods and the continuity of, of officers in those neighborhoods building that resilience. Yes, I mean, it, um, it, the, the continuity of officers and the continuity of, of, of faces is is absolutely crucial uh, in terms of uh, in terms of this. Um, you know, the reality is that many many officers um, uh, want to be part of that uh, community and want to work with local communities and do an amazing job day in day out and doing it. I think it's one of those things where as we look at um, uh, at measures and we look at outcomes, you know, we often focus on what I would call the high end, high harm outcomes of, 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 of crime. We ought to be looking about things like, you know, how resilient is that community to external shocks? Now, how you measure that, there's a whole, whole uh, raft of work to do. To, but, you know, actually, what is the role of policing as part of building that resilience with the local community and the understanding from the local community. And I can think of many examples during my policing service where I have been incredibly grateful that the particular challenge we had was policed by an area where an officer had deep personal understanding of what was going on in that community, could tell us things about that community and understood things about that community that myself in a in a in a in a, a management position or even one step removed from the geography would have found hard to interpret and understand in a way that made sense that's the real benefit but those people aren't just there in policing they're there in local authorities they're there in health workers they're there in social workers all the way through to uh, uh, people who work in local shops in that area. So there are huge ways of tapping into this. You know, one of the ways I try to understand um, uh, the, the farming community, rural communities, where when I worked in Cumbria, was what we call farm gate meetings. And people sort of looked at me and said, well, what is a farm gate meeting? We literally met at a farm gate with four of the local farmers and said, what are the issues affecting your industry? Because it is a big multi-billion pound industry. Uh, and sometimes we sort of gloss over it, move on. It's a multi-billion pound business uh, that affects the UK economy. So it's important we understood the threats that, that was posed. All the way to being in London and going into a, uh, uh, in, my, in, in my job in the Met, going into the board of, of, of some of the largest companies in the UK and sitting with, with senior members and going, right, what can policing do for you and what can you do for policing? How we get those things going is, is how we have the success. Okay, um, and perhaps just one final thing from me, perhaps before we turn to some questions that have been raised, is how can business really lead in contributing or helping in building the stronger of the community, particularly obviously with regard to your expertise from the police side, but also more generally? I think it's important that we do what we can as business. Yeah. So, so I think first of all, it it it, it it's groups such as your own, um, and it's groups such as uh, uh, there there are many many uh, business groups that, that that work in this space. Uh, and I would encourage any business step into this space. One, it's hugely rewarding for your staff uh, in terms of uh, their ability to 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 better understand the communities in which they work, um, but also very much for the business, it's a way of developing a relationship at a local level that sometimes if you're a national or multinational business is much more complex and much more difficult to have. I would say to business, don't be frightened and in stepping into this space. You know, the dare to share what you know and the dare to share what the police service knows, I've always found has been incredibly beneficial to both sides. Um, 
it's not always easy to do. Um, data sharing is, is easy to say, it's actually sometimes quite complex to do, but actually getting beyond that and sharing real data and understanding with each other has real, real benefits. So I'd say to business, please, please continue doing the work you do with policing and law enforcement. It is incredibly important. And I know colleagues in law enforcement would want to continue being part of and doing that work with you. Thank you, thank you. Um, can I come back just to the people issue and some of the some of the points that I know uh, have been raised? Um, and that really is focuses around, I suppose, first of all, the background of the individuals um, and trying to match as much as possible those in neighbourhood policing with the communities which they're serving. Um, and clearly, that becomes difficult because you, it may not match that easily. But what are the your thoughts on the experience that, that gives and the help that that brings, particularly looking at, at, at the BAME communities and the BAME representation in the police force? I, I, I mean, it's an incredibly important issue in terms of, uh, uh, of, of, of where policing goes. And it, it's not just, I think some people uh, have, have sort of looked at it and said, well, this is, this is an issue that's, that's, that's purely about numbers. I've always seen it as, absolutely about effectiveness and legitimacy with communities. Um, you know, the reality is that we, we're working with communities and working with communities that are different, however that difference might be, and whether it's communities of geography, communities of religion, communities of approach, you do need people who are able to flex and work across those. So it's absolutely vital that the, the police service continues to attract a wide range of people coming into the service and I saw over 34 years in policing the, the organization that I left looked very different to the organization that I joined and I think that's incredibly beneficial and and for all those who sort of retire and say it's not like it was in my day I will say to people no it's not like it was in my day I think young officers coming into policing when I left were far more capable than I ever was they were far more able to understand risk, understand difference, to manage complexity, to manage a workload that I would never have had to manage as a, as, as a young operational officer on the streets of Swindon back in the early 1980s. They have a completely different uh, outlook uh, and a set of values. Um, but what is absolutely clear, they bring that same passion that I'd seen all those years ago to actually do the right thing for communities. So I'm I'm absolutely I'm incredibly positive about the quality of people coming through. But I don't underestimate you have to keep driving those issues through. And the work policing is doing around recruiting, particularly around uh, uh, retention and progression, is vitally important in that. I think also it might be something we see um, uh, as a result, and it's far too early to talk about lessons from this, this uh, uh, the pandemic, but what I would call the valuing of public service. We've seen a very, very different public debate in a relatively short period of time around people's understanding of what public service is and what it means to be a public servant. And I would absolutely include policing, law enforcement, and many, many other areas into that. That's quite interesting because, you know, I'm sure you're right about, you know, that there will be over, you know, the coming months and years, a greater recognition of, you know, what the public service does for the country as a whole. Um, but if I can just pick up the point you, you, you were talking about, you know, that young new officers might might learn and bring to the organisation and, you know, at, at, at the level that you were at when you finished your career within the police force, that how do you match those two? Because you're bringing certainly an element of culture, uh, they're bringing an element of new experience and so on, um, but your, you know, distances apart, if you like, in terms of your yeah, your, your roles and being a, the ability to match those two across the board. Yeah, no, I mean that's a that's a I think that's a perennial problem for many organisations. You know, quite interestingly, I've I, I work with a number of organisations in retirement, including some uh, uh, private sector and and third sector agencies who wrestle with exactly that same thing uh, in terms of how you bring it through. I suppose for me, it's it 
it goes to um, valuing valuing individuals and valuing people's input almost regardless of of, of position of organizational power and those sorts of things and you have to create mechanisms that allow that to happen you know so some of the things that um uh, were going on in the met things like um, a, a group called the commissioners 100 uh, uh when i was there where it was, a, it was a, a group of people who were sort of literally brought together and what are your ideas what are you thinking i mean things like police now and others came from some of those sessions where people said let's just think completely differently about what the world and the future could could look like and i think that's really important it's also particularly important where it's probably underutilized but i think he's getting better is in that whole space of the opportunities that technology will give us um having now sort of left policing and looking back in i wish i'd been able to do more to drive technology even faster because i'm absolutely convinced that's going to be a, a a deciding factor for many organizations and businesses going forward that doesn't mean buying lots of computers and that's it means how we use technology how we provide digital services how ai works how big data could potentially work what sits in systems at the moment and i think that's where bringing young people bringing uh, uh new ideas and bringing different ideas and i think it's this it's this um it's this thing that you I think certainly I learned it on my journey through my working life. I know I work best and I'm most effective when I have people around me who don't think like me. I quite enjoy being with people who think like me, but I'm actually I'm actually much more effective when I have a team around me who don't think like me. I recently did the, um, uh, and it's not been published yet, or the work's not been published, but I did the review of serious and organised crime for the government. And we had a team of people with me on that who um, uh, 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 we referred to as a stripey team because it's civil servants, police officers, all sorts of people. And we all thought quite differently. And, and I actually, it just reinforced for me that energy, that dynamism of thinking makes you think, no, actually, there is a different way of doing this. We could do it like this. So I just encourage people, you know, in some of the work I do with coaching and mentoring people now, I say to them, you know, don't look for people in your team who replicate you. Look for people who are different to you. You will get far more yeah. from it. And does that mean that you're a supporter of the direct entry screens that there are? I, 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 well, I've always been on the view, you know, the reality is I, I, I think we had more to give than to fear from some of those sorts of things. I think, you know, I, I was incredibly proud. You know, there are some colleagues on the conference this morning, some of the names I know. You, you'd want to be led by some of the people on this conference this morning. They are really, really good people. And they might be in a position in an organization that's got nothing to do with the rank on their shoulder or anything like that. I've always, you know, what I saw was incredibly powerful. So I do think there are opportunities to think differently about how we bring people uh into the service and, and work through the service now for a whole variety of reasons some of those have not been as successful or in the volumes that people would have wanted but i think it does show a willingness of the police service to try and think and be a bit different just changing the subject to another question that's been asked um, looking at when there is some form of disruption and areas are cordoned off or whatever it may be um, that often disrupts business in that yeah. particular community. Um, and how, you know, how can that be speeded up that the disruption there is as little as possible and is in shorter time as possible? Well, I think, first of all, it goes back to one of those first points about information and communication. So I think sometimes the frustration as to why those things take place is we're not always as good as we can be at explaining why they take place. You know, so the reality is often the first time the business will know about it is I'll make up the delivery can't get through or something like that. And it's then a well, why? What's going on? What's happening? I've always found that when you explain, look, this is what's happening. This is what looks like the timescales. This is what we're doing. We're absolutely aware you've got a crucial X or Y at this point, and we'll aim to get it ready for that. Things work and things work okay. I think sometimes though, there is some unrealism sometimes around, uh, uh, around doing, you know, the reality is if something complex and important happens, 
uh, if something happens where somebody loses their life, there is going to be a disruption. That is the reality of it. I think we can explain it. We can explain why. We can ask for uh, your forbearance with it. But that's the reality of what's going to happen. OK. Um, and I think people do understand that. It's just trying to make sure that there's the right balance in terms of, of not creating too yeah. long a disruption. Um, one question sort of that's come through a different a number of different things and that's about recruitment into the police force um, yeah and question from me rather than trying to take the others and i'll follow up on those is you know, recruitment is immensely difficult into the police force i'm well aware of that um with the small involvement i have at least now which you mentioned uh, but how do you see that going over the, the the coming years is it going to be a greater challenge or a lesser challenge Gosh, um, so so I think there are two potential scenarios. I think you're absolutely right. Pre um, shutdown, pre the changes uh, uh, with the economy, it was absolutely clear that people were having to work incredibly hard uh, on recruitment in what was a, a, a very, very full labor market, i.e. there were lots of people in work, not a lot of people looking to move, and some of the challenges of, uh, uh, of getting people to coming into policing were quite large. I do, and, it, and it's, I do wonder whether, uh, and it goes back to an answer to the previous question, whether some of the work on the back of uh, the pandemic, whatever whatever the world looks like after that, people will start to make some different life choices about what they want to do uh, in terms of uh, uh, sort of the reward they get from it. And I don't mean the reward, reward in pure financial terms. I mean the reward in terms of the uh, uh, the, the fulfillment, the, the creation of the whole person around it. So I do think there is potential there for things to change in terms of doing it. The, the reality, though, is, and, you know, and, and I look back, as, as, as some others will do on the, on the conference over a, a relatively long period of time, these peaks and troughs have been around, uh, certainly for the, the 34 plus years or so I did in policing. You know, when I joined in the early 80s, police forces were running waiting lists for people to join policing. Um, almost eight or 10 years later, it was sort of please, please come, please come. Can anyone join policing? I think that is the reality. I think what's also happened with the um, uh, the, 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 the big uplift in uh, police recruitment that was announced tail end of last year, people have also seen how hard it is to actually recruit at volume and scale. You know, I take my hat off to, to, to colleagues working in HR and recruiting departments and these processes. They are not easy to run at the scale you need. You know, I, you know, my experience is the Met where standard turnover is 1,600 to 1,800 posts a year. So you need something that's turning away just to keep the organization uh, in, in a stationary place. Um, so these are these are big things that you need to do. And I think it's important we always keep looking at what attracts people to policing, why do they come into policing, what are the things and what are the barriers uh, that prevent them. I think one of the things going forward will be the very changing expectations around the nature of work. Um, you know, I can say this, having left policing, I was probably quite insulated from just how different uh, people see work in other sectors, you know, working with people in the private sector, quite openly say, you know, I'll probably do five or six different careers, let alone jobs, Craig, and you sort of go, what? You know, I thought this was, you know, I thought I'd been radical. I did too, you know, well, wow. Um, so I think we, uh, the policing has got to start to think about what does that different, what would a different offer look like? Is is a 35, 30, 40, whatever the, the issue is, is it that or nothing? Uh, what would shorter engagements look like? I think all of those things and all of those debates will come. Now, they won't be easy, and I'm not for one minute. I, it's not my role to propose them, but I think they're debates policing will have to have. And, I mean, looking at it from the outside, the, you know, the greater, exactly as you said, the greater depth of experience that people have across any organisation, the greater success it's going to have yes. to, be, to be prepared yeah. for those shocks that come along. Yeah. 
and and also the pace at which they're coming along now you know the reality is um you know as as i was leaving people said you know tell us what the future is going to look like i said well i can't i can't tell you know, if i if i could tell you that i'd be doing something else with my life you know but what i can tell you is the pace at which those shocks those changes come along will increase that's the reality of sort of my last 10 or 15 years in work in, in in the public sector they will increase in terms of doing it and you'll need a set of core skills and abilities to be able to manage those and you'll need to keep refreshing those and if one looks at the different challenges and this comes back to where i started with the discussions on the pandemic the different challenges that will continue to be presented to the police force as a whole um, and the, the resilience of the police force itself to be able to deal with those challenges how do you continue to keep the awareness open of you know if you like the senior members of the teams to being able to deal with those because they're the ones often who are more set in their ways and find it difficult to change what they're doing and i accept that's a very joke <laughs> But yeah, in my few years of experience, I've found that to be true. Yeah, no, no, but I, no, <laughs> it, it, it's taken in the spirit in which it was intended, I absolutely assure you. But no, so, so I think that is always a challenge. And I think that's a challenge with all organisations um, and, and colleagues from business will recognise as well. If you have an organisation that cannot hear or does not listen, you have a problem no matter what the organization is um, and cannot hear and doesn't listen is as much applicable internally as it is to external customers suppliers and those those sorts of things and and that's you know for anyone in a position of leadership that ought to be one of their key worries uh, in terms of the organization can my organization really hear the dissonant voices can my organization understand what it feels like to be the late turn control room operator at such and such or the person on the shop floor in such and such i think those things are really really important for uh, uh, for any leader but they're absolutely crucial uh, in this day and age and it goes to your earlier point particularly at the pace at which organizations are being asked to change evolve what they do um they're having to be incredibly sure-footed now will you find some people who are closed of course i'm sure you will in terms of that but i'd also put up many of the current leaders and say these are some pretty good examples still working uh coming through the system um you know i saw some people uh coming through in in sort of superintendent sergeant position brilliant PCs working with communities on a daily basis you think you know what in 10 or 15 years time if you're still doing that this community will have really really benefited so I, I'm quite reassured and positive about the future doesn't mean I'm not alive to the fact if you get it wrong it can be quite damaging both for individuals but also more importantly for communities uh, and those policing is paid to serve and perhaps I can just pick up, pick up on one final point. It's something you said in your introductory remarks. Um, and I think we'd all benefit from your thoughts on how to go about doing it. And that is the difference between hindsight and learning from the experience and how best to try and come out of that in terms of uh, organizational, organizationally, resilience wise and so on. Uh, yeah, gosh, it's so I, so I think and, and it, it's happened to me a couple of times uh, post incident. It took me a, a while in my sort of professional development to realize that to actually learn lessons is both quite professionally challenging, but, but also quite painful in terms of the process of getting to the lesson rather than the hindsight. And there are some, there are some really, really good examples out there. I think the reality for me is you need people when you debrief and look at lessons learned who are absolutely have an expertise in doing this who don't let you get away with i followed the book or i followed the procedure or you know in this why did you do it 
what did you feel what were the other options you know you you absolutely need that level of questioning and probing to get to those key issues of learning um and and, and you look at some of the examples i'm always taken for, for for those who've who've not seen it it's it's worth looking at the um uh national transportation safety board report on the famous um uh what's called miracle on the hudson the u.s air lines uh plane that went down in the uh, in the hudson river because if you look at the hindsight uh, when they when they run the tests on that incident uh on the simulators on the simulators you could land the plane back at the airport because everybody knew exactly what was going to happen so you can just dial in the vectors, the plane will come round and land it in the airport. If you're the poor soul who has to do that first off, you've got no idea you're going to lose both engines. And you've got a 20 to 30 second period. And they, for those who've seen the film and read the stuff, they'll know they dialed in this. But it, it, it's just a very small example of this issue about, I think we let people down if we put people into a leadership position and say to them, Here's all the things, if X happens, you do again. Because it might be X plus one, or it might not be X, it might be Y. So what is the real learning? And some of the real learning is often, it's the systems, it's the processes, it's how you develop your people. There are, there are of course, some key things that you have to do, but it's, it's often a quite a different thing, the learning to, you know, I'd, I'd always turn left in future rather than right. Um, so that's a real discipline that you have to get into. And that's why I said my, my, other, my other regret was I didn't spend enough time capturing that learning on a daily basis because I'm conscious as you go through uh, an event or an incident, what looks real and rational now in four days time can look completely irrational. Great, Th thank you very much indeed for your wisdom. Thank you. Because that's really what it has been. I'm gonna hand back to Rick if I may just to sum up and close the webinar. So, Rick, over to you. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Bob, and, and thank you, uh, Craig, for that um, really excellent um, presentation. I, I got a huge amount out of it, and I'm sure the other um, participants did too. Um, I'm, it's always hard to try to summarise these things to, at the end. And in fact, I thought your presentation at the beginning did a really good, excellent job of, sort of teasing out some of the key themes. And the thing that I'll really take away from it was the sort of of metaphor you used resilience being a sort of like a bank credit to a bank account because i think that's quite a helpful way of um thinking about this actually and in terms of how you know once we're through this crisis how we um, then build up our resilience you know what are the things that we need to pay into the bank account in order to make sure we're prepared uh, in the future uh, and some of the things that you you draw out for, for policing i thought were really important um, community policing, which um, we know is always the thing that ends up getting cut when there's less money around. But as as you rightly said, is absolutely fundamental because if if you know the first time, uh, if during a crisis people are turning up and it's the first time they've met and and they're having to establish relationships with one another, that that's not, uh, an ideal situation. Um, and indeed, I think that you know. One of the things that I think is, is we really have benefited from in this current crisis is the level of trust and legitimacy that our police do have, actually, because it's not with all the problems that people talk about. Um, you know, we we're in a pretty good position on trust and legitimacy in, in, in UK policing. And, um, and that's something that we've been paying into the bank account for a very long time. I'm, I'm not saying there aren't issues. Of course, there are always issues. Um, but by and large, you know, most people trust the police and the police have a good reputation. And we're, you know, we're very much relying on that now in order to get the kind of consent that we uh, we need and the cooperation that we we need. So good community policing was one thing that I think came out. The, the and all related to that, the partnership working, you know, having all building up those relationships, as you say, so that when the crisis hits, People know each other. They, 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 you know, they've built up that trust, that familiarity, and then they can, um, they can work together much more effectively uh, when these crises hit. Uh, and then I thought what you said also about how you prepare organisations for these kind of um, disruptions, I thought was really uh, interesting. The ability to flex 
and to be, you know, to have that capacity to shift around, which, as you say, in policing, I think is, is you know, people are used to doing actually because because of the need to do emergency response. But I think it's something that all organisations are now going to have to think about much more. Um, the, the need to plan. Um, but while leaving the space for creativity and innovation, which I thought was a really interesting point um, that you, you made, because you don't want to sort of plan uh, plan all the innovation out of the, of the system. Um, and this point about learning, which you just um, alluded to, is something which I think we all probably struggle with, because it's always something that's slightly on the, uh, the, the sort of periphery of the day job, is to sort of con continually try to learn. And, and we know that that's important for professional development, and it's really important uh, for this kind of thing. And I think that, that metaphor of the bank account, you know, these, the, the learning you're doing as you go is the thing that you're paying into the account that you can draw on when you 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 really need it. Um, and then the final point about people and about um, one of the most important things we need to pay into our bank account is, is valuing the people that we work with and that, that work for us. Um, uh, and there are lots of different ways you've, of doing that, which you've, you've described. But um, I think we're all aware at this time of how much you know, we rely on our public servants, our police officers, our nurses, our doctors and so on. And, and, and I think one of the big learnings from this crisis will be how we, you know, that make sure we value those people uh, in the future. So um, uh, too much to uh, summarise, really, but I, I, I just thought I'd draw out some of those themes. Uh, and just to say thank you very much, uh, Sir Craig, for your comments uh, this morning. It's been a really um, interesting session and you, you know as I say I think we've all taken a, a huge amount from it um, thank you to colleagues at Resilience First for organizing this um, uh, we at the Police Foundation continuing to work on policing um, we're doing a big strategic review of the police service at the moment and um, some of the thoughts about resilience that I've taken away from that I'll definitely feed into that review because it's been really useful so um, uh, I, I think we'll all try to capture some of the learning from this morning uh, in the future but thank you once again uh, Sir Craig, Bob, uh, and also thank you to all of you uh, for joining in this morning. Thanks very much. Thank you.